I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles this morning to the book of Isaiah. Two places in the book of Isaiah. First of all, find Isaiah chapter 57, and then also Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapters 57 and 26. Isaiah 57, first of all, and let me read verses 20 and 21. It says, But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Now go back to Isaiah 26. Isaiah 26. Notice there verse 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. There used to be a bumper sticker that would say, No God, no peace. But no God, no peace. K-N-O-W. These two verses coupled together illustrate a great uh, truth in the Bible. A life without God is a life without any real, lasting, eternal, satisfying peace. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Uh, yet Isaiah says, uh, the man who is trusting God is kept in perfect peace because his mind is stayed upon God. It's fixed upon God and the things of God and the will of God, the desires of God. Now, certainly everyone gets emotional throughout life over many things. And there are many uh, hardships and difficulties to encounter and to survive through in life. But the kind of peace the Bible is concerned with is that when once everything is said and done, once everything is over, the Christian is still in one piece. P-I-E-C-E. -E. He hasn't been destroyed and knocked around by all the troubles uh, in life that come, come up to him. And that's how a Christian's life ought to be. Now, the world you and I live in is a chaotic world. It is not conducive to peace. The world has gone nuts. It's crazy. And uh, what used to be maybe localized to your hometown or your state is now not just nationwide, but it's worldwide. And it's the idea that the world is an insane asylum. And the, in and the inmates, the patients, are running it. Think of the politicians and some of the stupid things they impose on the citizens. But um, if it's not the murder rate in your, someone's hometown, if it's not the drug rate, uh, drug use rate, or the divorce rate, if it's not crime and theft of one kind or another, if it's not child abuse uh, at the local gymnasium or sports field or uh, school or even religious institution, if it's not that, if it's not elder abuse in some nursing home that you read about and all of these shocking things, if not someone defrauding somebody else out of their hard-earned money and their possessions, um, it's something else. And all of these things, none of these things serve to inspire peace in people's lives. Whether you're saved or unsaved, you have to admit the world's gone crazy. Certain things used to be assumed. You could assume that your neighbor would leave you alone and you'd leave him alone. He'd respect your property. He'd respect the boundary between your yard and his yard. Um, and if possible, he would let you know when, hey, your, your gate is open, your dog's loose running in the street and vice versa. And, and you'd look after each other. You'd, you'd pay attention when some prowler was prowling around the neighborhood and could you look out for him, assuming that he would look out for you if the, if the circumstances were reversed. But nowadays, everyone just looks out for number one, and they don't want to be bothered with anyone else or anyone else's concerns. And uh, that certainly doesn't make for peace. That certainly doesn't give you a sense of comfort when you go to bed at night. Islam is commonly referred to as the religion of peace. But you wouldn't know that studying their history or looking at their current profile in the news, would you? You wouldn't think that at all. The Quran is one long, monotonous list of commands about who the Muslim is supposed to hate. So we shouldn't say those things. Well, you better say them now while you still have the freedom to say it. 
because the political correct forces in the world want to shut you down and uh, control your thoughts and control your speech, control your actions wherever possible. They don't even want you thinking something negative or critical of somebody else, even if that person uh, justly deserves it. In the Quran, their chapters are called surahs. And in surah or chapter 5, verse 51, we read this. O ye who believe, those are Muslims, take not the Jews and the Christians for friends. They are friends one to another. And whoso among you takes them for friends is indeed one of them. Verily, Allah guides not the unjust people. And in Surah 9, verse 5, it says, And when the forbidden months have passed, kill the idolaters wherever you find them, and take them prisoners, and beleaguer them, and lie in wait for them at every place of ambush. But if they repent and observe prayer and pay the zakat, that's a, an extra tax on a non-Muslim who, for the privilege of living in a Muslim country, you pay an extra tax than everyone else does, and pay the zakat, then leave their way free. Surely Allah is most forgiving, merciful. With that kind of mercy, I don't, I don't want. You know? In other words, force someone to convert or kill them. That's what it comes down to. But a Muslim who is not living up to the exacting standards another Muslim thinks he should is now under suspicion. He's now considered the enemy of Allah by the fellow Muslims. God told Hagar in Genesis 16, she would bear a son and that uh, and he would she would call his name Ishmael. Ishmael means heard by God. She cried out to God and God heard her, gave her a son. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Genesis 16, verse 12. The Arabs and the Muslims who trace their lineage all the way back to Ishmael have no peace among them. They don't have peace with one another. Iran is suspicious of Iraq. Iraq is suspicious of Iran. Uh, they're both suspicious of Saudi Arabia. Uh, Syria and Lebanon, they're suspicious of Saudi Arabia and of Iran. And they're all suspicious of Egypt. Egypt is suspicious of them. They don't trust each other at all. Never mind Israel. They don't trust each other. There's no peace between them. Uh, God's prediction came true in history, and it's true even to this very moment. But the Apostle Paul writes in the New Testament, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Romans 12, verses 17 and 18. And I don't know if the speakers have cut out. Can you hear me? Is the volume all right? All right. It's just up here. When a Muslim is, uh, seeks to hurt or to insult or to attack someone who is not a Muslim, he is being obedient to his scriptures. When a Christian lives that way, or a Christian does that to someone else, he is disobeying his scriptures. It occurs to me that if you have to keep telling the world that a certain religion is the religion of peace, it might not be so. You'd think it would be self-evident and you wouldn't have to keep repeating it. The Lord Jesus says in Matthew 11, at verses 28 and 29, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, for I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. The Christian is supposed to know and enjoy that kind of rest, both within and without, as he goes through life. It doesn't matter how old or how young you are, the Lord Jesus promises to give you uh, rest and peace, uh, peace of mind, peace in your heart, and uh, even in your body as you trust him along the way. A Christian is supposed to be stable. He's supposed to have good sense and good judgment and not to be knocked down or destroyed whenever problems in life come up. It's amazing how emotional we can be, how quick we are to react in the flesh, 
to get angry over some situation, to say, I want revenge, I want that person to die, rather than take a deep breath and trust God to deal with that person or deal with that situation, that problem that is beyond your control. Sometimes all you can do is trust God to deal with that matter. Um, and I don't mean, when we say peace, we don't mean to become a pacifist, where you, you don't even defend the honor of your family, you don't defend virtue, you don't defend your own testimony, you don't defend your family, you don't defend your property, you don't defend your country if called upon to do so. That's what the media wants you to do. That's their definition of peace. Life is full of ups and downs. There's a school to complete. There's a job to perform. There's an employer to satisfy. There are bills to pay. There's sicknesses to um, endure and, and sorrows and grief to endure as well. How does a first person find peace in the middle of all that? The Bible says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, temperance. Against such, there is no law. Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. It's not against the law yet to be meek and to have joy and to be at peace. But just give them politically correct time. They'll find a way to make it illegal to do those things. My call this sermon today, finding peace in a troubled world. Finding peace in a troubled world. First of all, a Christian should find peace because of his salvation. Because of his salvation. The Bible says in Romans 5, verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When two people are um, enemies of one another, a third person can come in as an arbiter or arbitrator a mediator to try and negotiate terms for those two people to patch up their differences and be reconciled to each other once again. And in a way, that's what the Lord Jesus Christ's death at Calvary does between the sinner and the Heavenly Father. Because of your sin, you become the enemy of God. But by the Lord Jesus Christ, he bridges the gap between you and God so that you can both uh, enter into a fellowship with one another again. And uh, what a blessing that ought to be. 2 Corinthians 5, in verse 18 says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of, of reconciliation. So you as a believer help to bridge the gap for some other sinner and the Heavenly Father. You help restore their fellowship with God through the knowledge of Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection for their sakes as well. The major difference between God's peace and man's peace is God's peace will be eternal. Man's peace never is. The Bible says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the only begotten Son of God, uh, 1 John 5, verse 13. You should find peace in your salvation because, number one, you don't do the saving. God does the saving. All you can do is the trusting. That's all you can do. Secondly, when God saves you, He saves you for sure, for certain, and forever. You never have to worry about it crumbling or disappearing or disintegrating or falling apart or wearing out or growing old and disappearing on you. It's just as vibrant, just as alive, just as real in you right now as the day you trusted Christ, even if it was many years ago. What a blessing that ought to be. And second, or thirdly rather, uh, you find salvation, uh, peace and salvation because you'll never have to worry about going to hell. You never have to worry about going to hell. You know, the worst thing that will ever happen to a child of God, the worst thing that can ever happen to a true believer is he dies and he goes to heaven to be with Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's the worst thing that can happen to you. You shouldn't worry. You have nothing to worry about. 
And uh, there's an article I found several years back on how religion helps people reduce their stress. But let me read just a paragraph from that article. Um, Dr. Roxanne Gervais, a senior psychologist at the Health and Safety Laboratory in Stockport, that's in the UK, surveyed employees to find out how content they were with their working lives. The study concluded that employees who are more actively religious are more likely to report low levels of anxiety, depression, and fatigue, and also higher presence of meaning in life, that is, feeling that their lives have purpose. But you know, for us, it's not just a religion. It's not just a faith to us. It's a relationship with the living deity who controls the universe. That's who you know. That's who I know. That's who dwells within us by the Holy Spirit. How many people have secretly troubled lives because they don't know where they're going when they die? They might show it. They might not show it. But if they don't show it, they, they'll turn to something else to sort of ease the tension, ease the anxiety they have when they go to bed every night because their lives are unhappy and miserable. So to avoid thinking about it, they'll, they'll focus their attention on the present life. These present bills, these, this present money, these present possessions, this present marriage, this present relationship, and these present accomplishments and achievements, and think that those things that are in the here and now, in the present, can somehow translate into lasting eternal peace. It never does. But a Christian should find peace because of his salvation. And turning a page here, let me move on. Secondly, um, the second point is also found in our text. It says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. And point number two is this. A Christian can find peace because of his sanity. Because of his sanity. You're supposed to be mentally sound if you know Jesus Christ. To be in perfect peace with God means you should have a, a clear and a sound mind to think and reason with. Your sanity is intact. You have a firm grasp on, grasp on reality. And uh, your thoughts are kept on God and the things that are pleasing to God. Things that will honor Jesus Christ and ways by which you can uh, be a soul winner and reach someone else for Jesus Christ at work, at school, on the street corner, at the grocery store, wherever you might be. The Bible says, be careful for nothing. That means full of care. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. In this day and age, too many Christians are not praying. They're not making their requests known to God, and they are filled with care and uh, full of worry. Churches today don't want preachers that can preach the Bible or teach the Bible. They want someone with a degree in family counseling and psychiatry or psychology. Those are some of the most sought after, excuse me, qualifications in some uh, new pastor. What can you do for our family? And so they, they try to restructure the building. They try to shape the, it's not called the church property. It's called the, the campus. Well, am I going to university? Is, am I going to school? What is it? And um, it's not fellowship hall where believers gather and thank God for their blessings. It's called our family life center. Usually that simply means it's a basketball gymnasium. They put in chairs and stuff and they have special attractions. Our family life center. Everything's the family. Everything is cut. The Bible says, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God one day. Your parents might take you to church, but if you're not saved, you have no desire for Jesus Christ. Uh, attending, you can attend every week. Still go to hell. The most important thing is your relationship to Jesus Christ as a sinner who needs to be saved. And then after that, a Christian who needs to grow in the grace and knowledge of God through the word of God. All of those other things will take care of themselves if you get your mind fixed on the word of God. I wish people would grasp a hold. I wish Christians would grab a hold of that fact. Get your attention, your focus on the Bible. 
spend time reading the Bible, spend time studying the Bible, pray about questions that come up when you read the Bible, ask God to lead you to find the right answers to those questions, and you'll have a real sense of accomplishment. You'll have a real sense of achievement with God. It's unavoidable. But in a church our size, and we're not even a big church, but in a church our size, it's assumed that some of you are crazy, and some of you are in need of mental counseling, mental help, emotional help. And you can tell how dysfunctional modern Christianity is by the advertisements you hear on so-called Christian radio stations. They go, they go like this. Are you depressed? Are you filled with anxiety? Do the cares of life seem to be closing in on you? Is life unbearable? Call one of our caring professionals at Maranatha Agape Koinonia Counseling Center. There, a loving prayer partner standing ready to help. To let you know all is not lost. God cares. God loves you. Let us help you too. Call 1-800-whatever-whatever-whatever. <laughs> I mean, you don't hear that kind of stuff on secular radio stations. You don't hear those kind of counseling advertisements on, on regular radio stations. But you sure do on so-called Christian radio stations. And they have... You see, when you... Dr. Ruckman said it all goes back to the fact that modern Christianity doesn't have the Word of God. They have some counterfeit. They have some artificial version. They call it the Word of God. But it's filled with, mis with mistakes. And they'll even point out the mistakes. Right. You read the introduction to the NIV... And uh, the translator said, This version, like all versions, made as they are by imperfect men, undoubtedly falls short of its goals. Well, if it fell short of its goals, why are you selling it to us? You see, they're not interested in you knowing the Word of God. They're, they have a product they want to sell. They're trying to peddle the Word of God, which the Apostle Paul warned against. Paul writes in Romans 12, verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus heals a man that was possessed with a legion of devils, the Bible says, running around the graveyard naked, cutting himself, and a crazy man. And uh, when the Lord Jesus healed him, and the townsfolks came to see what was going on, we read, and they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil, and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And then the, and then the last part of that verse adds, and they were afraid. Mark 5, verse 15. They liked it better when the guy was crazy. They knew what to expect from old Charlie out there at the cemetery. <laughs> Go out there to old Charlie and just tell him something and see what crazy reaction we get from him. They liked it that way. But when somebody's sane and sound, he's got a sound mind once again, they don't know what to make of it. The Christian should have peace because he's in his right mind, thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 1, verse 7 says that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The Greek word, and I've said this to you recently, the Greek word, which is pronounced suke, but in English, it's translated as psyche, P-S-Y-C-H-E, means the soul. Look of any dictionary, and the first definition is uh, it corresponds to the word soul. So psychology properly means the study of the soul. Psychiatry, the treatment of the soul. Man's greatest need is not simply mental. Man's greatest need is not emotional. It's not financial. It's not physical. Man's greatest need is spiritual. The Lord Jesus told Nicodemus, ye must be born again. And how does a person find peace when his mind is not stable? When he's been knocked around by every other influence in life to make him go at half out of his mind with worry. I picked up a magazine years ago, it's still published, called Psychology Today. The, the subtitle used to be for Mind, Body, Spirit. Wait, there's no mention of the soul. 
Soul and spirit are not the same. Soul and mind are not the same. The soul is an unseen uh, shape of you. It's an unseen body, un unseen by the naked eye, but it is nevertheless an invisible shape of you, and it's capable of wearing clothing, it's capable of communicating with other souls in the unseen world, according to the Bible, Luke chapter 16, Luke, uh, Revelation chapter 6, and other places. And it's like taking your hand out of a glove. The glove looks like the hand, it moves like the hand, it has the shape of the hand, but it's not the hand. The hand is on the inside. And when you die, the soul, according to Genesis 35, 1 Kings chapter 17, the soul comes out of the body and goes to one of two destinations, either with God or to, to torment. So the soul is the real you. And I found an article, um, Why Shrinks, that's a, a negative, a derisive term for psychiatrists, Why Shrinks Have So Many Problems. Suicide, stress, divorce, psychologists and other mental health professionals may actually be more screwed up than the rest of us, according to the author of this article. This is a lengthy quote. Let me read it to you. In 1899, Sigmund Freud got a new telephone number. 14362. He was 43 at the time and he was profoundly disturbed by the digits in the new number. He believed they signified that he would die at age 61. Note the one and the six surrounding the 43. Or at best, at age 62, the last two digits in the number, 14362. He clung painfully to this bizarre belief for many years. Presumably, he was forced to revise his estimate on his 63rd birthday. But he was haunted by other superstitions until the day he died by assisted suicide, no less, at the ripe old age of 83. That's just for starters. Freud also had frequent blackouts. He refused to quit smoking, even after 30 operations to correct the extensive damage he suffered from cancer of the jaw. He was a self-proclaimed neurotic. He suffered from a mild form of Agoraphobia, that's the fear of going out in public. And for a time, he had a serious cocaine problem. And the writer says, neuroses, superstitions, substance abuse, blackouts, suicide, so much for the father of psychoanalysis. But are these problems typical for psychologists? How are Freud's successors doing? Or to put the question another way, are shrinks really crazy? And then the writer continues later, the problem is that mental health professionals, particularly psychologists, do a poor job of monitoring their own mental health problems and those of their colleagues. In fact, the main responsibility for spotting an impaired therapist seems to fall on the patient, who presumably has his or her own problems to deal with. That's just nuts. His problem is what was he had no peace. He had no peace. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. He tried to analyze people's problems and ignore the one who made the mind. That was God. Freud divided a man's personality into three parts. And he had terms for them. The id, the ego, and the superego. Those are simply secular um, uh, counterfeits to the three parts the Bible reveals about body, soul, and spirit. He tried to analyze the three parts of man without giving credit and recognizing the one who made man and made those three parts. That was God. Uh, you are to be balanced in life, but it's a spiritual operation. It is not simply achieved through um, devoted uh, mental effort on your part. Paul says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, set you apart completely. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul 
and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. The Bible says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Those are physical things. But righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Romans 14, verse 17. So without God, Sigmund Freud died hopeless and helpless, and he had no peace. It is if you want perfect peace, you're to seek those things which help to make for peace. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. Romans 14, verse 19. I had a guy text me early this morning, and he asked if... Uh, someone could be a punk rocker, a Christian, is there such thing as a Christian punk rock if the person's uh, intention was to honor God and witness for Jesus Christ? And I had to text him back early this morning, and I said, no. It's the music itself that either creates peace, recall how David played for King Saul and the evil spirit left him, or the music itself promotes violence. Exodus 32, when they came down from the mount uh, and Moses saw that uh, Aaron had led all the Israelites around the a golden calf doing the Watusi with all their clothes off. Remember that? And, and um, Joshua says there's a sound of war in the camp. It's not the sound of one being overcome for mastery or those being uh, slain. It's the sound of music, the sound of singing, do I hear. The lyrics are irrelevant. The type of music will either stimulate peace and calm, or it will destroy peace and calm. You know, there have been scientific studies. And um, uh, some kids do this, they're homeschooled, they do this for their science project. And they'll, but they've been done by professionals, where they'll take living house plants of the same age, the same uh, level of development and maturity, and they'll put one in a room and bombard it with nothing but heavy metal music. They'll give it the water and the light and the sunlight and the, and the uh, food they need, or the, the moisture they need, and they'll simply bombard it with punk rock and rock music, heavy metal, and in another room, they'll bombard the one with nothing but classical music, Mozart, Bach, Beethoven, Handel, and which plants do you think thrive, which ones shrivel up? The ones in the, in the rock room uh, many times wither towards the speakers and try to crawl, head towards the light, try to get away from the music. They've observed this in scientific uh, settings, or lab settings, I should say. And uh, so I texted him back. I said, someone who says he's a Christian rocker, uh, only does, and he's only doing it for God, is lying. He loves rock and roll more than he loves God. I said, I know that because once upon a time, and I've told you, I wanted to be a Christian rock and roll singer. Don't ask me why. And uh, I don't think it was a very good one anyway, so thank the Lord I got out of that. But I heard these other guys that, you know, they were just frustrated rock and roll singers. And I thought, well, I can make a career doing this in Jesus' name. But they knew about that much Bible. See my fingers together? <laughs> they knew no scripture at all. They just loved rock and roll more than they loved God. I said the, the lyrics are secondary, they're irrelevant. The music itself is either, either promotes violence or promotes peace. And so, but as you grow as a Christian, you begin to learn these things. You begin to discern these things. You say, you know what? That is more tranquil. That is more peaceful. That calms my heart down. That helps lower my heart rate when I have high blood pressure. That helps reduce my stress, my stress level, my anxiety. That helps me think more clearly on my way to work. That helps me get ready for the day ahead. But the other, not so. But everything from the way you dress, the way you talk, the way the kind of music you listen to, the kind of books you read, the kind of magazines you look at, the kind of TV shows you watch, the internet and so forth, the kind of jokes you laugh at, the kind of jokes you tell, um, will all have an effect on your peace of mind before God. You need to keep that in mind. Uh, David said in Psalm 101, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. 
Him that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. That eliminates the Disney Channel. That eliminates CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, NBC, maybe half of the Fox network as well. That eliminates uh, Ellen the Degenerate. Uh, that eliminates all kinds of things on television and on the internet. Christian parents uh, need to be mindful of the things they expose their children to because every one of us is going to give an answer of ourselves before Jesus Christ one day. But the Christian should find lasting peace because of his sanity. And I'm going to move along here for time's sake. Thirdly, he should find peace because of God's supply. God's supply. Isaiah says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Many people don't have peace because they're not trusting um, God when they ought to be trusting him. Paul says in Philippians 4.19, But uh, my God shall supply all your need, not all your greed, but all your need, according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The Philippians determined to send Paul money and provisions for his needs, and he commended them. But he said to them, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned uh, in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Philippians 4.11 whether you're in a state of prosperity and success and blessing or in a state of hopelessness and despair and poverty or in the state of West Virginia or Michigan. You're supposed to be, you're supposed to find peace because of what God has supplied you with. You know, the Bible says, uh, having, there, having uh, therefore food and raiment, let us be therewith content. Most people say the basic needs are food, shelter, and clothing. Paul doesn't even include shelter. If you have food and clothing, you're to be satisfied. If you have a home and a roof over your head, that's extra. That's icing on the cake. And yet, because we live in an affluent and a successful society, we think because we can have everything, we should be, able to, we should be entitled to everything. And if that other guy has more than we have, that's not fair. That's what you hear in the, the, the news these days. It's not fair. Nothing in life is fair. Some of you are taller than me. That's not fair. Some of you are, not many of you, but are, are better looking than me. That's not fair, right? Some of you are younger than me. That's not fair. Some of you have more education than I have. That's not fair. Some of you drive a nicer car than I drive. That's not fair. What's fair in life? The, the skinny guy thinks he needs more bulk, and the fat person wants to be skinny. None of that's fair. You know what? Only in Jesus Christ can you and I have any sort of uh, common um, agreement. Would it be fair if the rapture took place and you, you survived in a you know, 25, 30-year-old body forever and somebody else is stuck in a 95, 100-year-old body? What would be fair about that? But everyone will be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's, he's the one we agree upon. Only in Jesus Christ is there real equity and fairness. Uh, among men. But a Christian should find peace because of what God has supplied him with. Be thankful for what you have. Be thankful for... I said this recently, but be thankful for problems you don't have. Remind yourself that no matter what trouble you might be going through, somebody else is going through a worse trouble. Somebody else's circumstances are far worse than your own. Let me move on here. I said a Christian should be satisfied with God's supply. Point number four, a Christian should find peace with God's sentence. And I don't mean, usually the word sentence is used in negative connotation, like a judge giving a sentence to a criminal. But it can go either way. And what I mean by that is what God has decreed for you. Second Samuel chapter 13, David has an affair with Bathsheba. And that results in the uh, birth of a child. The child is born sick, and David mourns and fasts and doesn't bathe, doesn't wash himself, uh, worrying about the child, worrying sick, what God might do for the child. And when the child finally dies, David gets up, changes his clothes, and washes himself, and so forth. And God stepped in, and he decided the fate of that child. 
no reason to mourn, no reason to cry, no more reason to pray and uh, hope and be filled with anxiety, wondering what might become of that situation. God had decided the fate of that child. And I said, recently, there are two things you should never worry about, <clears throat> the things you can change and the things you can't. And someone reminded me when I said that, what about things that you can change, but maybe you shouldn't? Maybe you shouldn't change it. Sometimes we, we think we're smarter than God. We think rather than accept the circumstances I have and see if I, God can't help me make something good out of it, uh, let's see if we can't just change it all together. We're smarter than God. God made a mistake. You can't think that way. You can't approach the Lord that way. In the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 9, the Apostle Paul says he prayed three times for God to take away a thorn in the flesh, and we believe it was his poor eyesight. And each time God replied, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness, in your weakness. He never did, never did get that prayer request answered. Only accepting the, um, the way things are, rather, things the way you want them to be, um, will never bring peace. You'll find peace when you accept what God has decreed for you. And point number five, a Christian should find peace in the scriptures. In the scriptures. What would you do without the Bible to turn to? Now, if you were stranded on a deserted island, you know, like those cartoons, there's always some guy on a little island. Funny how those little cartoons, there's a, a little piece of land, or an island about 10 feet wide, but there's always a tree on it. <laughs> Why is there always at least one palm tree on those, on those little one-man islands? Let's suppose you were stranded somewhere in the desert or an island in there, and they could tell you you could have one book to read to keep you company. What book would you take? Only a crazy man would take something other than a Bible. But do you love the Bible? Do you spend time reading the Bible? Sometimes I notice um, some folks come to church and they don't think to bring their Bible with them. Listen, we're not like a lot of churches where we're going to give you a Bible to read so you don't have to bring your own. I expect you to bring your own. We have Bibles back there on the table. Those are for first-time visitors who might not have one. But if you're a regular um, churchgoer, you come to services, I assume you're, you have a Bible, you're going to be reading it. So don't ever let me catch you not bringing your own Bible to church. But a Bible that's worn out is usually owned by a Christian who's not worn out. That's a great dictum. It's a great motto. You're not, you're, you're not sa if you're not saved, rather, you need to be saved. This is our desire. This is our hope. And all of these things will, are conducive to bring, bring peace, peace in your heart, peace of mind, some measure of comfort to your soul and your thought life and your daily living, your relationship with other people, your satisfaction with God, your, your love and your communion and fellowship with God. All of these things should be um, a part of peace that comes to a Christian because he's saved, he's sane, uh, God supplies God has given him a sentence that he should be happy with, and he has the scriptures in his hand. Our religion doesn't depend upon statues and images and candles and incense and a special priest class with special clothing and all kinds of decorations in the church building. Those are theatrical props. Those are distractions to get your mind off of the real spiritual matters at hand. Our religion doesn't depend upon that. Our faith doesn't depend upon Our faith uh, is only supplied by one physical object, and that's the word of God. And uh, if that doesn't make for peace, listen, if God, the Holy Spirit who inspired the Bible and lives inside of you can't teach you the Bible, nobody else can. 